Tito made it up here also. Yeah, actually, I can do something really fast if you'd like, or I can wait. No, go for it. Okay, let's break down like the nature based versus uh, industrial based and like what is actually possible and what is still needed in order to make the large numbers possible. So, uh, globally, soil carbon could sequester maybe at most, like uh, these numbers I'm going to give are like the total addressable market size. So, we're not going to actually reach that. This is just maximum potential. Soil carbon is maybe 5 billion tons a year. Forestry estimates vary widely, anywhere from like 2 billion tons up to 20 billion tons. I think it's more likely on the lower end just because the land for uh, reforestation is often in competition with the land that is used to grow food. And as the population of the planet continues to grow, we will need to grow more food. Um, Kelp is maybe two to four or five billion tons at the absolute most and we are nowhere near anything approaching that type of scale yet uh and, and then you get other things like blue carbon mangrove restoration that sort of thing uh so at most let's assume that we could eke out like 20 billion tons annually from nature-based solutions that's still dramatically short of that 50 to 100 billion number that I shared earlier. So this is going absolutely going to depend on scaling up industrial solutions, most of which is likely going to be direct air capture. But here's the other problem. There's nowhere near enough energy to actually power uh, that much direct air capture. And of course, that has to be carbon free energy, right? So uh, I, I can't remember where I saw this. Uh, so don't hold me to this number. But I believe I saw an estimate that the, the amount of energy required to run that much direct air capture is something like between five to 10 times the total amount of energy that the world currently produces. So it's, it's, we're talking about a massive, massive scaling problem. And, the, and I think, of course, the only way that we could ever possibly meet that sort of energy requirement is with massive deployment of nuclear energy. It is the only technology that we know of that could ever meet that sort of scale. So that's the, uh, those are the sort of numbers um, that I think about. I think it's very possible to do, but it requires like uh, exponential growth in technology innovation. Cool. And, and uh, Jim and Tito but, and Neil, before everyone talks, if you guys could just give a, like a quick you know, intro so people know who you are, kind of the angle you're coming from. But, uh, um, but Jim or Tito, go, go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I'm, I'm Jim Mann. I'm the founder of the Future Forest Company. So we are nature-based, started off with nature-based solutions, but recognizing the problem um, particularly reforestation was where we were focused, but recognizing the problem of lack of land availability and led us to look at other things, in particular um, enhanced crop weathering and, and biochar as potential solutions or partial solutions. And just following on to, to the theme of sort of addressable market, land-based enhanced crop weathering, you're probably looking at about two, two gigaton potential per year if it could be fully... Um, fully maximized and biochar is harder to, to, to actually um, to put a number on and in biochar you're really fixing existing biomass but looking at waste feedstock this could be two two to five potentially gigaton solution um, all of these markets though again um, problems with um, scale scale up the real problem and, and we look at it from a perspective of even if you can completely decarbonize, you, you're still looking for at least 10 gigatons per, per annum of, of removals that we'll, we'll need to do. And um, we tend to focus on the longer permanence um, because, uh, and repeatable longer permanence. So that's why biochar and enhanced rock weathering are, are particularly interesting to us. If you, you look at carbon removals, alone, so ignoring nature-based solutions. We're, we're at a few thousand tons at the moment. I think Charm Industrial are probably the leaders and, and did something like five or 8,000 tons of, of, of removal and storage last year. Um, Climeworks' new plant is sort of 4,000 tons per year of direct air capture. The problem we've got is to get that to 10 gigatons, I, I think, I was trying to just quickly work this out, but I think that's six orders of magnitude. And to increase solutions six orders of magnitude is, is a huge challenge 
So I completely agree with, with, with Paul when he says, look, we've got to throw everything at this and it's not going to be one, one solution. But we really, we really need to start doing that straight away. And this is what interests me, particularly in the, right, the, the refi space. And we're not active in the refi space at the moment. We're sort of looking at what's there. We're trying to understand it better. And we're looking at how we can um, fit into that ecosystem and hopefully accelerate things. But it's that, that broad reach and that ability to act beyond the scale of nation states that, that's going to be so important from from my perspective and, and why refi is so exciting and so important that we can find these connections between effectively projects and technology developers like ourselves and um, refi networks where the there is access to just this this huge scale um, and hopefully we can find those connections so um, yeah quick happy to I'll hand over at this point um, but we're we're looking for for people to you know to help us in, in those areas. Jim, th thanks for that. We really appreciate those numbers. Uh, you know, the 10 gigaton number is one that I hear a lot. Um, you know, there's there's the, the road to 10 gigatons game that John Sanchez and a few others started. Uh, but, but Tito, you know, your, your motto with air miners is, is we need a thousand shots on goal to do this. So I just want to get your thoughts on those numbers that people have mentioned and kind of how you're looking at it and in terms of where it needs to come from. Sure thing. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm new to navigating Twitter spaces, but uh, feel free to do a do a hundred if your head is spinning from all the numbers so far in this talk. It's all great stuff. Uh, I, you know, even as somebody who thinks about this and works on this every day, there's, there's, yeah, just one observation of the conversation so far is like, there is so many freaking numbers that can't keep track. Uh, generally, so, so uh, I'm here representing air miners. Uh, we are working on how to accelerate uh, carbon removal solutions. I think the the number that I would throw into the into the soup is that there are on the order of three thousand people uh, worldwide that are working on carbon removal presently. Uh, that number was uh, calculated by our very own Jason Grillo, who's the best director for Air Miners. Hey, Jason. Uh, I also see Anjali is here. I was trying to wave at her through the Twitter thing, but there's. I can only I can only report her or block her. <laughs> What's up, Anjali? Um, anyway, so so yeah, we're you know we're focused on on how to create more more solutions. Uh, there's only three thousand people working on this. Um, Jim spoke to that that need for a, a million fold uh, improvement in our in our ability to pull carbon dioxide from the sky. Um, and and you know when I think about air miners as a as a community as a system, I just think about yeah, how do we uh, how do we get to that million fold, you know, order of magnitude? And it, it comes down to the fact that there's what, uh, 50, maybe a hundred people here in this room. That means, you know, each of you is contributing to that because, uh, you know, we need on the order of, uh, you know, you to go out and tell, uh, or you, know, you, you to work on solutions, but also to be a part of, uh, of, Where that's where Airman comes in in terms of uh, if you got an idea you know, or people thinking about about ways just just solve for the S M. It's not zero, but um, you know, in terms of exponential growth, like we're on the very left-hand side of the curve. In terms of uh, you know, working with very small numbers that are growing very quickly. Voluntary carbon markets grew, I believe, sixty percent year over year uh, this past year. Um, but yeah, again, like just thought of, like so many freaking numbers. Like, who are all these people that are listening, and like, what do they think of all this? Where do they see their role as as like getting involved in this or or participating in it? Because that's uh, that's what we you know do a lot of time thinking about air miners. Is how do we build a system that enables uh, thousands of, of new solutions um, and people working on, on, on them. So that's me. Uh, back to you, uh, Timo. 
Go ahead, John. Yeah, cool. No, Tito, I so appreciate that. And just a quick kind of background and synthesis, um, because everybody's coming from a different space, like uh, depending on who you are, where you've come from, we're talking about carbon removals because of the problem of climate change, which is unequivocally linked to increased concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, one of which is carbon dioxide. And so um, just want to make sure we're anchoring it to that that kind of central piece. And I also just want to kind of um, put out there that I think we can talk about carbon dioxide removals and the technology and the science all we want, but underpinning all of these challenges and crises is you know systemic social injustice and inequality. And I think we can look at these at the same time. I don't want to segue the conversation in that direction today, but every time I'm on these refi hangouts, I just really want to harbor um, this notion that we have an opportunity to redesign how society works for the people who've been marginalized through this process of transition of creating new forms of economies, new currencies, and new ways of interacting with natural systems. So I'll segue back to you, Timo. I know we've got some other people we want to introduce on the panel, but just trying to uh, yeah touch on that point, because I think it's it's an important thing to, to keep repeating. Yeah, no, great. I, I mean, I, I totally agree, John. And that, I mean, that's why we're doing these in terms of in the refi context, like carbon is just a component of this. And there's these whole, all these other things that come along with it, right? With, with monetary incentives, value exchanges, equality, uh, organizational structures, you, you name it. Basically, the, you know, the society we, we have, right? I don't think our you know, grandparents, parents, great-grandparents like did it on purpose. They, you know, the opportunity at hand for them might have been potato farming. It might have been the gold rush. It might have been oil. It might have been e-commerce. It might have been automotive industry you know what you know might have been the, the semiconductor industry like you name it their intentions weren't to basically degrade the earth and you know create this inequality that exists today uh but i think we need to be more like intentional right john about like how we do it is kind of kind of the, what what i see the refi community doing of like okay how do we do this intentionally how do we design this from like a systemic and like systems perspective and um you know, and actually reinvents the way we do things so it's regenerative and sustainable. Yeah, for people and the planet. Yeah, totally. Love it. Keep going, man. Love to see who else is on the panel. Seems like we've got some really interesting people up here. Cool, yeah. Um, we have Tom, Neil, and Anjali. Why, why don't you guys introduce, you know, whoever wants to go, just introduce yourself, and we'll, we'll kind of move into the next uh, questions here. Oh, well, hello and hi. Um, my name is Anjali Underwood. Uh, hi, Tito, by the way. I'm new to this, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm working on a myriad of things, uh, but my longest standing uh, passion project is the Appalachian Carbon Exchange. Um, and I'm going to echo some of what Timo said earlier, which is um, really the focus on conservation, uh, which is what it was born out of. Uh, and carbon, I've always viewed it as the carbon markets as a, a mechanism for financing conservation. Um, so I'm not going to necessarily be able to play as much into the, the gigaton numbers that we need to, even though there's huge value there and, and appreciate the work that everyone on this um, uh, hangout or call or whatever this is, um, is doing for sure. Um, but we, we, you know, I, I modeled, modeled, I modeled my thinking after this organization called Fiber Shed, started by Rebecca Burgess out of Northern California, and she takes a water, a, a fiber shed, a watershed-based approach to looking at local textile economies, um, and she's done it really, really, really well, um, and sort of doing that same thing, but looking at ecosystem restoration and conservation practices um, around where I live, which is in the Southern Appalachians. Um, really taking the idea that smaller scale projects are just as important, even though the scalability doesn't necessarily always reach project development feasibility. Um, and so by taking that regional focus, we are looking at what we have, uh, looking at what works with us and what, what we can develop in our space. Um, for example, coal mine methane, um, mature forest carbon, um, and our very specific um, heat island urban needs as well um we're looking these are all future future looking right now um but that's sort of the goal and we are really excited to move forward um, and have some action as well as engage our regional businesses and climate action which is something that that is um desperately needs to happen in this part of the world 
So it, it, I mean, honestly, that kind of goes back to the initial question on the call, right? In terms of what do we need in terms of scale and size? And I, I think what I'm hearing is from, from everyone is like, we need all of it, right? We don't actually know the exact scale. Like you can do numbers all day long or do math. And some people like think their, their numbers are better what whatnot. But like at the end of the day, we need to remove massive amounts of carbon dioxide from the air. But I go back to this nature approach of like, if, if our financial system doesn't work or if we've, killed nature and you know the, the rate of ex- species extinction right now is a thousand times higher than historical extinction events um and you know basically a million species basically per year um are are, are being wiped out and we don't know what kind of cascading effects that's going to have in terms of, of our environment so i go back to this point of like it doesn't matter how much carbon we, re- we remove if we've already destroyed our you know, the species and our own livelihoods in the process. And then, you know, it's like a three-legged stool. So like money on one side, carbon on the other side, nature on the other side, and people are kind of, you know, in that, you know, that, that, that triangle or that three-legged stool. So I feel like we have to do all three and we have to do it at scale. And so I, so I really like your point about like small projects matter as well. Yeah, totally. And great to meet you, Anjali. Thanks so much, Timo, for introducing such amazing people. I'm continually blown away how you keep up with this space. Um, just to touch on that, like, yes, we need to remove massive amounts of carbon dioxide from the air, but we also have to decarbonize the entire global supply chain across transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, energy production, right? So it's like, you know, just want to make sure we're emphasizing these key points for anybody new coming in that we got to remove carbon, but we also got to decarbonize and we got to do them both now <laughs> or we're all screwed. <laughs> so if you haven't jumped on the climate crisis, climate action bandwagon yet, this is a great opportunity to see some of the ways you can get involved. But I just want to make sure that that's like a super clear narrative. Like we got to do both. Yeah. But yeah. I, I go back, John, to the, the holistic approach. And, you know, you and I have talked about the, everyone's heard the IPCC report, you know, the, the news from that, but there's, there's actually a report from June that if you, know, you can DM me or you just look online for the, it's the IPBES joint workshop report with the IPCC. And they talk a lot about uh, biodiversity and uh, what's called adaptive capacity and more holistic uh, solutions, which you know, they, they call it the, the climate social nexus, basically climate biodiversity social nexus is what they call it. And it's a, a, a basically a, a holistic way to look at systems and why we need to do both and how they're interdependent. And that's, it's a great, fantastic summary report that came out in June of this year. Um, so to, just real quick before Neil and Tom introduce themselves, um, I, I have a couple of requests for questions, but if we could just save those, I, I know we're kind of already going through time here, but um, we're going to do some Q and a here at the end, but, but let's uh, introduce uh, Tom. Why don't you go first? Cause you're here. Or I guess Neil, uh, Neil's got his mic off. So Neil, why don't you go first? And then Tom, why don't we hear from you next? Sounds good. Hey, everybody. My name is Neil Spackman. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Regenerative Resources. And uh, I'm a terraformer by profession. I turn deserts into forests. We uh, are focused on coastal communities and coastal regions. At this time in our company's development, uh, next week we will be publicly launching projects in Mexico, Ghana, Spain, and Namibia. We have Mozambique and Oman are probably going to be announced with some real meat behind them in six to eight months. And what we do is we address the conflict between human development and environmental protection. The pithy line I like to use is that it doesn't make any sense to grow trees unless we address why people are cutting them down in the first place. So what we do is um, we partner with local coastal communities, fishing villages uh, primarily, and uh, develop regenerative economies in partnership with these communities, which unlocks the space to restore degraded coastal ecosystems. Uh, um, these projects are about to na- announce their total pipeline cost is about 250 million. Uh, in those, in this first set of projects, we're estimating 20 million tons of carbon sequestered 
primarily through sea grasses and mangroves um, in agroecological settings. So we do mangrove agroforestry, we do seagrass, multi-trophic aquacultures, in addition to just ecosystem restoration. The <clears throat> I, I'm really happy to hear the focus on how carbon is a stand-in for nature. My personal sentiment is that carbon is a somewhat crude stand-in for the greater ecosystem services we need and in some cases can be quite myopic uh, because it doesn't matter how much carbon we draw down if we keep destroying ecosystems and deforesting. If, if we don't have functioning ecosystems, we're all going to die anyway. Um, but it is a very important piece of the, of the overall puzzle. And uh, something that I'm really happy has developed as a market over the last 25 years or so because it does allow for us to do work that that is nature positive and, and is an interesting stand-in. The work we're doing in the Web3 world, um, I don't want to go into too much detail about, but Chainlink will be doing a press release and an announcement on Tuesday. What? <laughs> a really cool project we're doing with Chainlink. Um, and we intend to have our first NFT-based biodiversity credits 12 months from now. And I'll leave those as teasers. Cool, it's cool. That, that's so exciting, Neil. Like, like I love the um, the word terraform, or like you know, basically creating something <laughs> out of nothing in a way, right? Of, of like the, the idea of the desert being turned into forest or agroforestry, or uh, you know, the, the work you're doing with aquaculture. Uh, it's just amazing. Like, and, and Neil, just for for reference, um, like the, the average size project you guys are looking at. What, like hectares or, or acres, what, what size in terms of land use? So our, our phase one in Ghana is 7,000 hectares. Our phase one in Mexico is, um, it's actually two projects spanning 20,000 hectares. One of them is strictly agroforestry and the other is strictly um, ecosystem restoration. Uh, Namibia is very small starting out. We've got a 3,000 hectare farm in the Kalahari with a, a brackish water source. Um, and a 40 hectare site on the um, on the skeleton coast that will be a, a prototype for the rest of that coastline. Um, so we were looking at, at you know decent scale landscapes to start off with. Our goal, kind of our the mission of our company is to grow millions of hectares of mangrove forest back. Cool. Well, I think you know one of the, the most interesting things to me, John, you know, and Neil about the the refi space here and in, in the community of the people on the call or the people we're interacting with is like, like Jim, I, you know, if you haven't talked to, to Neil, for example, like I'd love for you guys to get together or, or Paul and Tito or, you know, like, or, you know, like just the people on this call, like reach out to the other people on this call, like follow, follow the other people, DM them, text them, whatever, like that, that's where ideas form, right? Like, every, you know, these, these conversations we have is how we move this, this whole thing forward. Um, so, so just make sure to collaborate, right? It's a community. And with that, um, I, I do want to get Tom up here on the stage. So if, if everyone can say hi to Tom Duncan, who can provide like some financial background on kind of what, what they're working on and how, how we finance this. Hey, yeah, and just briefly, just piggybacking on that and just one of the core values in ReFi is to collaborate and not compete. Let's support each other, connect with each other and find ways to focus on our strengths and really overcome this kind of old world extractivist you know, self-preservation mindset. We all need each other in this. So I love that spirit. And thanks, Tom, for coming on board. Can't wait to hear about you and your background. Yeah, awesome to be here. Uh, love this uh, refi space and uh, all the speakers. Uh, thanks, Tim, for speaking um, about your project. Super inspiring. And thanks to the host. Uh, yeah, so I'm Tom, the founder and CEO of uh, EarthBank. Uh, a bit about my background. I grew up... Um, on farms in Australia, um, one on the edge of a desert, uh, and we were growing uh, all sorts of horticultural crops, and uh, the other farm was uh, high up in the mountains inside of a state forest, uh, growing kiwi fruit. And what I found through that experience growing up was just how freaking hard it is <laughs> to be a farmer. Um, I guess that formed some of my views uh, about you know some of the things that are really difficult 
um, transitioning to regenerative agriculture like our family was, uh, and the, the troubles and challenges you face. Um, at one point, interest rates got to about 20%. Uh, that was in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that created a, a deep recession. And so what with wildfires, floods, uh, and uh, interest rates going up to 20%, um, yeah, it was pretty formative to me about how I tended to view some of the challenges and then also what could some of the solutions be. Um, so yeah, in 2004, I was working with AusAid um, on a, a very large grasslands uh, restoration project in Central Asia. Uh, it was about 18 million hectares. Um, it was covering the Inner Mongolia grasslands plateau and then right down to the Central China Plains, which was basically the, the breadbasket of China at that time in 2004. Um, and just seeing the massive scale of challenges they were facing um, and, you know, the emergence of carbon markets and CDM, I saw the rise of that and started working on uh, red projects and red plus projects in 2011, uh, doing feasibility studies and then saw kind of how broken the carbon markets were. And I got more and more into the financing of, of regenerative agriculture, also renewable energy. Uh, efficient cookstoves, uh, some biochar projects, uh, biodigester projects. And over time, uh, you know, got a lot into the sort of how do we improve the verification of these projects that we're financing. Uh, and yeah, so over time, uh, oh, yeah, can you guys still hear me? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, over time, you know, developed EarthBank, uh, launched it in uh, 2018. And, uh, you know, we got some venture backing from the European Space Agency uh, to develop, you know, remote sensing and more data-driven carbon monitoring, reporting, verification and auditing as part of what we we're doing for financing of regenerative projects. Um, and yeah, it's just been on a journey since then, helping carbon projects get, get the carbon to where to, to buy us. Uh, and also helping project developers with the uh, MRV side of things and bringing the costs down for that uh, from where they've traditionally been uh, and increasing the periodicity uh, so that the permanence uh, and uh, the additionality and leakage is being monitored more closely uh, so that the, the claims are more accurate. And so, yeah, I started tokenizing trees and carbon in 2017 uh, on Ethereum. Um, and, you know, played around with that, um, talked to a bunch of stablecoin projects. And yeah, you know, I've been in the sort of this space for a while now. And, you know, we, we love what Regen Ledge is doing. And, you know, we, we want to be able to tokenize carbon and put it on there. Uh, you know, and we're just really excited about launching more of our green digital bonds to, to finance regenerative agriculture and watershed restoration projects. Um, one, one highlight of my career probably was being part of developing the nitrogen offsets market um, in Australia, uh, where we paid farmers to essentially filter the runoff coming from their, their fields. Uh, and yeah, that raised about $300 million uh, in the, the catchment that surrounds the city of Melbourne. About 5 million people, about 1.3 million hectare catchment. And um, it's just a really cool example. It was about in 2007. And so what I saw was possible with nitrogen offsets and farmers bidding to supply those ecosystem services to me that's kind of where we need to need to be going um and but and that's the promise of refi of what i see uh, the opportunity and you know we want to support as many uh projects and platforms as, as we possibly can and protocols and be part of the the glue that helps helps it work and be in it a piece of enabling infrastructure as well cool well, well thanks tom and i, I, I want to I'm going to direct a question at Tito for Tom to answer here in a minute, but I, it, we're kind of coming up on time. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm fine. It's, it's almost two o'clock my time. I, I'm here till um, two thirty. So whoever wants to stay, great. Uh, start sending your your audience questions. Uh, raise your hand. We'll we'll just bring in audience members here in a minute. Uh, but but I'm just going to keep going. Whoever wants to stay, and if you have to jump, if you're a speaker, panelist, listener, if you have to jump, no worries. A lot of people have Christmas shopping, holiday shopping to do, you know, kind of the last business day before uh, the holidays start. But, uh, but Tom, I, I had a question kind of, you know, your overlap in the traditional financial markets versus, um, you know, kind of working with refi or DeFi in the new, you know, blockchain crypto spaces. And, and so I'm, I'm setting the stage to ask Tito, like, 
Tito, how do you see like direct air capture kind of fitting in to what you know a lot of us are, are working towards in terms of the nature-based solutions with the Ethereum and uh, Cosmos and the other chains? Like, like where do you see like direct air capture and technological fitting into into the financial system? And then maybe Tom could uh, could maybe answer that, or, you know, kind of once you say what your thoughts are. Okay, so the question is, how do you, how do I see a specific technology for carbon rule called director capture fitting into the uh, the carbon market? Well, kind of, well, kind of like it in terms of like decentralized finance, right? Like we, you know, Jason and I have talked about tokenization and um, and, and just using these new financing mechanisms. And, and maybe you could just talk about how you're. You know, like your launch pad, like the in the, uh, you know, from a technological standpoint, like how are you financing projects, right? And how do you see those projects getting traction, getting market share, and scaling those? And then, you know, in, in context of like, do you use private equity? Do you use banks? Do you use, you know, any kind of tradfi? Or is there an opportunity for technological carbon removal in these new DeFi markets? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, just off the top of my, you know, where, where I'm at is I, I don't really use the terms nature and technology too much. I think they're just, they're, they seem increasingly less useful. But I mean, we, there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We need to take it out. Whether that solution is named one thing or the other, I, I don't think it, and I don't think that's a big differentiator for uh, for the demand side or, or, uh, or that. Um, I really like what, what Paul said in terms of, you know, permanence is a, uh, a way to start kind of making, I think, important measurements or important comparisons between different types of solutions. Um, but ultimately, yeah, if we're not able to put a, you know, put a dollar cost on these things, um, or maybe not a dollar cost specifically, but a some sort of value cost on, um, on taking molecules of uh, CO2 out of the air, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to, to get very far. Um, it seems doubtful that we'll do that at a kind of world governance level, like maybe, but um, I think a lot of people on this call are here because there's a different way of um, of, of looking at this, and I think that's uh, that seems pretty interesting um, and and promising. Uh, just one one plug as we get to the top of the hour um, for people here that are kind of you know, looking for different resources, or you know, again, we need we need a million fold uh, engagement, and so like everybody listening here. Um, like our goal for today should be that you're working in this field, you know, 12 months out. Um, and that's a high bar, but like, how do we pull that off? Um, if you're interested in working on climate solutions more broadly, there's great resources. Uh, one is work on climate. Uh, you can go and, and, and meet a community of other people that want to work broadly on climate solutions. Um, there's also Terra.do uh, for uh, kind of more formal, formal learning about broad climate tech needs, solutions, where you can fit in. Um, Air Miners has a specific program called Boot Up, which is if you want to get rabid about carbon removal, uh, if you want to get up to speed on all the different types of solutions for pulling carbon from the sky, uh, Boot Up is a free five-week uh, like online book club kind of format. Uh, and and generally, I only hang out with people that are. <laughs> it's not like an exclusive thing. Like generally, I meet people at the point where they are rabid about carbon removal. Um, and so, if, you know, if you are rabid about carbon removal, you should certainly check out uh, Air Miners Launchpad. Um, which is our uh, program to work with people who have ideas and teams, uh, early stage uh, solutions. Uh, and, and we work with you for, for six weeks and, and help get your company point in the right direction. Uh, specifically, you know, a shout out for any uh, women founders uh, or, or uh, founding teams uh, that are from more diverse backgrounds. I think specifically, you know, even looking through the audience of, of this discussion today, like we are not on track for where we need to be in terms of uh, creating the you know the, this future, and so um, you know even when the, even when the numbers are small, I think it matters. Uh, it matters even more. Um, you know, we won't get to ten, 10 gigatons if we're not uh, if we don't do things in the in the best possible way from from today forward. So you all listening, um, you know, I, I, yeah, this whole this whole listener speaker dichotomy is a bit. It does. It doesn't work for needing to scale a million fold in on the order of decades. So sure. um, I, I want to help you figure out how to, you know, engage in that. So work on climate, tear dot do, air nice. miners boot up, and uh, and air miners as well. So that's my that's my take. And I'm gonna hop out. It's been wonderful. Nice seeing you all. Th and thanks, Tito. Next one. Appreciate. It. So um, 
Justin, you had you had a question to, to Tito's point about bringing people up on stage. Uh, go ahead, Justin. Tell us what you're up to and what your question is. Yeah, thanks, Tito. Um, hey, everyone. So yeah, Justin Alanis, um, co-founding right now with a bunch of other people, a, DAO, a new DAO that's focused on um, ocean innovation and conservation. Um, and what Neil was talking about is very much in the vein of, of I think, how we're going to be um, approaching this and tackling this. just want to say a few things. First, I appreciate all the transparency and open innovation that's happening in this space. And I think it's going to have to continue to happen. Ultimately, um, what we believe with this new DAO, it's called New Atlantis, is um, that when you can create decoupled economies from the U.S. petrobac dollar, then you can, as a community, ultimately point value at the things that the community finds valuable. And so we're working with Paul Nicklin and Christina Metemeyer, who I think probably some people from this who are listening here probably know them. They're the most famous wildlife photographers in the world. And we're going to be launching an NFT series with them and other artists. Um, and then we are creating, we're trying to create ultimately a decentralized community and really push the limits of what DAOs can enable um, in um, and, and launching a token that has a protect to earn uh, function in the same way that Axie Infinity really had a play to earn function within their economy that draw the incentive structure within their economy. And so um, we have uh, people like Dr. Maureen Ramo, the head cli climate scientist coming in and leading our science research. Uh, people like Paul Nicklin coming in and helping us lead the regeneration efforts and, and um, all of our research there. And our Paul Hawkin, sorry. Um, and so we now have about 30 members um, who are in our DAO doing actual work um, and pushing us towards an NFT launch and a token launch sometime in Q1, Q2 of next year. I just wanted to come up here and um, and announce what we're doing a little bit to this community. And ultimately, you know, we are looking for um, more innovation and more people to come in and help us with the various aspects of what we need from a DAO perspective, whether it be governance or uh, tokenomics um, or actual projects on the ground where we have already, we're talking to some of the Caribbean nations about tokenizing some of their natural resources, particularly around mangroves and other elements like that. And so, yeah, I'm really bullish on the power of what crypto and Web3 economies can um, enable in, in this space. And ultimately, our belief is that, you know, exponential decay curves need exponential solutions and things like existing financial structures and NGOs are just not going to cut it. So, yeah, nice to meet everybody and really excited to um, be a part of this community. Yeah, th thanks, Justin. Uh, that's super exciting. Um, you know, something that the, the refi we, we've discussed in the past here is that, you know building currencies, right? To, to what you hinted at, building a monetary system that's instead of backed on gold or, or oil or coal or, or God forbid even slavery, you know, back in the day or, or trade or whatever, um, it, it's built on something that's regenerative or, or you know what, what the term we keep using is positive outcome backed currencies. And so you know, something we've talked about is like, at least, at least my opinion is that we're not just going to have one currency, right? Like it's not just going to be the dollar that's backed by these new things or, you know, whatever the new token is, or, you know, I'm not, not going to use any examples, but th this world domination of one currency to me isn't going to happen. I think it's going to be baskets of currencies, bundles of currencies that are all backed by positive outcomes, you know, regenerative type systems and people will put their their money where their where their mouth is or what you know where their beliefs are basically so in, in terms of yeah build, building the world we want to see yeah i agree with you and i think that you know financial products are essential and i think they're going to be the way that we really fuel this new economy but ultimately you know one of the things that i can't i, I think we can't lose value or perspective of and i think it was mentioned earlier in in the session is that we have to create an army of people who are incentivized and inspired to go and create that change and the incentive structures are a part of it but Ultimately, you know, things like NFTs and art and artistic expression can help create new cultures and, and um, new cultures around the formation of communities that I think are really um, uh, have a huge amount of potential to inspire and motivate people to enter into this ecosystem. And then, you know, one last thing I'll, I'll say is that the power of decentralization today, I don't think it's, you know, we're still in the early innings, but ultimately if we can have truly a DAO structure and ecosystem that becomes exponentially scalable, 
then you can develop these these ecosystems almost like a neural network of people who are working on this all simultaneously that all connect together in very interesting and dynamic ways and you know when i sold my last business my last tech business i i exited had enough money to think about anything i could do in the world and i looked at climate change and i studied it and i studied it and i studied it and i said i don't know where my entry point is i don't know what to do and i think a lot of people face that same like element of resistance just like not knowing how they can contribute and i think dows open up a new path for contribution that's never been possible before yeah 100 percent. and the, the the joke is is that people don't work for one employer anymore right they they work for who do you work for oh i work for 50 dows basically and there's there's services like opolis who are basically providing the services you know the the w2 the retirement accounts, uh, all the back end stuff that a, normally an employer would provide, you can actually just sign up for Opolis and they, they run it on the blockchain and you, you never know the difference, but it does all that stuff for you. So you can actually work for multiple DAOs, to your point. Mm. You can hop in your DAO, you can hop in our DAO, you can hop in, you know, Klima DAO, whoever, and do, do work. Uh, Eden DAO. Um, but, but Justin, thanks for asking, you know, coming up and tell us what you're working on. And then um, I want uh, Jesse. Uh, we've had some really good conversations on Twitter and you raised your hand and I want to welcome you to the stage and what, just, say hello. Just quickly before we uh, say hey, Jesse, I'd love to hear that. Um, I just want to emphasize one point of what you said, Justin. I was really blown away by you. Um, but just this idea that, yes, we have this uh, potential for scalable exponential growth in decentralized communities like DAOs, but we need to really recognize that DAOs are largely being represented by a single group of humanity, which is white, middle class or upper class tech people. And I think it's so important to recognize that when 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the world's population, that means that we're missing 80 percent of the questions, 80 percent of the opportunities, 80 percent of the unmet needs that we can use to drive really genuine systemic change that works for everybody, not just for the people who already have. And so I, I just want to encourage everybody in a space to look outward and recognize all the people who are not here and make sure that we're looking outward towards the fringes of society saying, how can we remove the barriers to entry? Because not everybody can be on Discord all day. Not everybody can you know, have the time to learn how to set up a wallet and engage in these networks. And just want to like really have that as a core concept in this in this um, community here. But yeah, love love to pass off totally Jesse great. and hear, hear about you. Oh. Go for it, sorry. <laughs> hey guys, I uh, really appreciate everything that's been said. It's been an excellent uh, first spaces for me. And and I'm a real rookie here. I, I just got into the, the crypto and the kind of DeFi rabbit hole here this fall. And and I would say the refi rabbit hole is is just as deep as, as any other. It's, it's been quite an interesting journey so far. And, and I, I don't come from tech or, I, you know, uh, have a ranch and and work in the oil field uh, in Canada and it's it's been very interesting seeing what's going on. There's a I think it's it's really amazing and and I think there's a lot of room for uh, landowners and and people on the ground to get their incentives aligned with with this and it's just um, communicating that and getting everyone up to speed and and I just had a, a quick question and and hopefully it's not um, too redundant or whatever but I was curious is uh, today the the topic was carbon and natural capital, and is there a is there any kind of marketplaces for natural capital or or biodiversity right now? Kind of like the voluntary carbon market, or is is that what everyone's trying to to build right now? Um, yeah. Why, why don't t Tom or Neil? One, I mean, I have some ideas, or maybe Jim. Why don't one of you guys answer? I think Tom might be the best position to talk about the market i'm not waiting for a market on biodiversity credits to emerge i'm just going to make biodiversity credits and throw them out on the market and see who values it um uh, and then may you know it's a bit of a chicken and an egg thing but the way we're doing that is we are using edna data where we take soil and water samples and work with a group called nature metrics who can analyze all the strands of DNA within that vial of water and tell you every every species whose DNA is floating in that water. And we're also using bioacoustics 
where um, you put up microphones on a site. These microphones record all the sounds made by nature and people on that site pump through an AI system that recognizes the sound of every unique species. So we're, wow. we're using these two main tools to track biodiversity change on the land that we manage. Um, in a previous iteration in Eritrea, we had a 1,000% increase in bird biodiversity. That was not done with nature metrics and bioacoustics. Those technologies weren't out yet. But that's, that's data that's verifiable that we don't control, and we're going to attach that data to NFTs and put it on the market and say, okay, here's so the biodiversity cool. credit. Who wants to buy it? Love it. Absolutely love it. I'd love, um, Timo, if that's cool to hear from Claudia Herbert, who's a Berkeley PhD candidate that I uh, happened to stumble on Twitter a couple of weeks ago. She had a really interesting thread um, kind of under, yeah, unpicking the Klimadao theory of change narrative and had a really amazing conversation today. Um, Claudia, I've seen you accept the request to speak. You happy to just say, hey, introduce yourself and share some of the stuff that you've been thinking about? to hear everyone is working on such different projects and I think even just the discussion about like how we're valuing permanence or like is it important to have distinctions between natural versus like engineered solutions I think all of this is like really fruitful and amazing that so many people are working on it like and I think like we were talking about you know like making sure we can figure out how to make this space more representative of the people that we're trying to make solutions for I think would also be like a great thing. And yeah, I don't know if there's anything more specific. Yeah, to I, I think just, you know, trying to understand a little bit more about the kind of remote sensing and the spatial data science lens upon both, you know, forest carbon sequestration, but also biodiversity and how you feel like this is playing into the Web3 movement. Yeah, you know, I, I'm definitely not an expert, but I know there's projects like Open Forest Protocol and others that are thinking about how to integrate satellites to monitor like natural carbon offsets so we can use earth observing satellite satellites to look at anything that is happening on earth's surface and so i use these to study things like forest carbon offsets and california's compliance market and we can use them to understand questions about additionality so whether or not the money that was paid for an offset actually caused any changes and we can use these to look at things like permanence or durability and so this is stuff that I initially got into the offset world from was because I wanted to get what happens when these like forests that are evolved to burn catch on fire, right? That that's kind of can be incompatible with us wanting them to sequester carbon because natural systems flux, like they sometimes take in carbon, but they also emit carbon. So yeah, <laughs> totally. And and I'm I'm sorry to put you on the spot there, kind of conjoining two very different worlds, but I think. You know, what you've shared is a really interesting nuance that I didn't perceive when I first entered into looking at climate change. I just thought like, yeah, you can just plant all the trees and they'll suck down all the carbon. But the kind of notion of um, a rising temperature changing the environment in which fires are potential to create and the impact that that has on these carbon markets, which have basically sold off a kind of trajectory of carbon sequestration over time. And it kind of reinforces this problem of accounting. How much are we actually sequestering? And there's sort of that side of it. Um, but also the fact that, as far as I understand, naively, that as the planet continues to warm, there's also a kind of photosynthetic breaking point where the process of converting carbon dioxide into oxygen actually begins to degrade in these natural systems. Is that kind of a fair understanding or have I missed something there? I mean, man, it even gets more complex where the amount of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere even changes how some plants like can do photosynthesis or like the efficiency of their water use. So, I mean, these systems are incredibly complex and as different like effects of climate change manifest, that'll even make it harder. Like we are managing for systems that are experiencing so much change and we're trying to act like they are stable so that we can fit them into a market. And so I think that's where um, like adaptive management ideas or being able to monitor what's going on, figuring out what we are selling to make sure that we're selling legitimate things or that we're able to monitor what's going around 
going on and course correct, right? Like if sure. if it's not making sense, then we have to figure out how to fix it. Yeah, and, and I'm just so keen to maintain that level of kind of intellectual clarity as we grow this regenerative finance movement to be intellectually honest about the evidence that's being purported and making sure that our efforts are resulting in impact in stabilizing our climate as the end result, but also not neglecting these really intricate, complex natural systems. And uh, I loved the piece that you shared with me about kind of a pushback towards this scientific reductionist view and looking at what are these, you know, um, microbiological systems, these fungi networks that are underneath forests, and how do our lack of understanding about these systems, you know, impact the way that we approach, um, you know, addressing climate change. And it's like, I don't, I don't know much about that layer of complexity, but I think it's really interesting what you opened there for me. And just curious if you had any more thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, like, I think like people are talking about, you know, carbon is one thing that we can measure, but all of it matters. And like, fortunately or unfortunately, we are going to be the people that either figure it out or we don't. So we have to figure out how we can keep these systems intact as they are changing and as we are expecting them to do even more. And yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's too specific, but yeah, it's, it's a huge weight hey, that we all have to work Claudia, on. Hey, Claudia, I, I just want to say hi and, and I encourage everyone hey. to follow you. You're, um, you're, yeah, they're not quite tweet storms. I mean, that's what we call them. They're, 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 they're very detailed threads. Like I, I almost call that like mini blogging, but they're like so informative. Right. And like, yeah, I mean, I mean, some of the other ones like Cody Sims does a great job at that, but, but yours are like great in terms of like Klima, like breaking stuff down, like kind of intellectual arguments. So I, I wanted, wanted to just say thanks for that. Um, but two, kind of to like what you were saying about like, and what John was saying too, about the complexity of the systems, and it's like, we don't know what we don't know. And so, so I, I come at it from this angle of like, we need to probably protect as much as we can until we know, or until we think we know. And so I, I wrestle with this, the whole, you know, like whether it be the, the 30 by 30 program, 30% land and water conserved by 2030. Like, I, I don't think that's enough is my feeling. Like I, like I fall into the EO Wilson camp of, of half earth. And I encourage everyone here on this, this call to kind of do some research in terms of like, what camp do you fall into? Like, if we don't know fully, like to John's point, like what's going on underground, or if we don't fully understand how trees are communicating, we don't fully understand what that, what a species decline or, you know, a, 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 an extinction, extinction curve might do to the overall system. Like we probably need to just play it safe. It's kind of, kind of my argument. So I, I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think it's interesting to watch how we do conservation efforts and as someone who like comes partially from a land use background there's definitely can be like competing needs for different lands and i don't know i just i want to put out there that i really believe that like humans are part of nature and you know working lands are part of ecosystems like all of these things we have to figure out how we can support all of them and oftentimes some of the early implications of carbon offsets were actually like coming into conflict with indigenous land tenure and like you know we have to really be mindful and be watching what we're doing so that we can like honor all of these systems right like it's not just the carbon accounting or just the ecosystems it's also like how are the communities surrounding those places surviving and are their needs being met and is it being managed in a culturally appropriate way like i think all of these things have to be like equally important because you know we, we you know humans are part of these systems as well so not just not to make it easy it wasn't ever easy for us and, and, and john you, you probably know what i'm going to say next in terms of, of directing everyone to the core benefits label that we uh <laughs> the, the, the climate sprint we did this summer sure claudia I, I'll, I'll send it to you but uh, basically looked at instead of you know, doing a carbon project where that's the primary benefit and everything else is a co-benefit. We, we looked at externalities and biodiversity and ecosystem services and said, okay, how can we reframe the narrative on this? And so, we, you know, we came up and other people have worked on it also, but the idea is that everything is actually a core benefit and it's like this holistic lens that we, we should all, you know, not, not to preach, but we should all be looking through in terms of like water quantity, water quality, species, carbon, biodiversity, 
jobs, income, profit. I mean, like all, all these different nexuses, energy usage, and like you know, any piece of land use should go through a lens like that. You know, it's it's almost like a, a shortened LCA you know type assessment of like, okay, how can you make your project better and and more holistic. Um, yeah, maybe I, I, I might jump in and, and talk a little bit about you know, what I've seen in this space in the ecosystem services marketplace and a more holistic approach. And, you know, I guess over time, uh, it's become apparent that, you know, some of the most successful ecosystem services uh, markets and, and biodiversity markets have actually been government led, which is which is really quite interesting. Um but what ultimately kind of then failed and shows kind of the real deep problem with government-led um, ecosystem services marketplace is that politics changed so quickly, uh, political parties changed so quickly, uh, and and preferences and, and 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 certain biases kind of you know make make these markets untenable. And so what I've seen is there's a, in the past there's been very high levels of coordination uh, to achieve. Uh, ecosystem services market outcomes. Um, I was involved in something called Biodiversity Broker, uh, which was um, selling biodiversity credits. Um, that was alongside nitrogen offsets, alongside carbon offsets. And so Australia's got some of the most advanced uh, examples, I would say, um, that have been you know fully data backed as well, um, much more data driven. But ultimately, so 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 I see this big challenge, you know, uh, in the refi and defi space. And DAOs is that you know previously the most successful examples have been very kind of centralized government policy and extension officer led and and basically funded by grants and tax payers. So I guess the challenge I want to throw down to uh, this community is to say, well, how can you uh, get better levels of coordination, uh, and how do you actually do that and achieve coordinate coordinated outcomes? Uh, and I think this is really the promise of refi. And that's why I'm so excited about it because I know uh, so many people on this call uh, and out there as well are working on this exact thorny problem of how do you achieve uh, seriously high level coordination uh, so that you can get um, you know markets agreeing on how to price positive externalities versus negative externalities. Um, so we're working with a number of DeFi projects. Uh, so please, if you're a DAO DeFi project, uh, carbon refi project. Please get in touch. Uh, you know, we we're here to help, um, particularly on carbon permanence um, and doing full ESG audits uh, projects as well, and helping arrange some of the bridging finance. So often projects really struggle in the early days to get money up front to do the initial design documentation, and so I guess what we're trying to do is bridge um, CFI and DeFi into ReFi, uh, and uh, yeah, we're we're here to help in that regard. So. Yeah, I just wanted to put that out there for everyone. That, that, that's awesome, Tom. That's, I mean, that's, you know, kind of to what John said earlier in terms of like offering a helping hand or like collaboration rather than competition like that, that those kind of offers, right. Or like what's going to make this movement happen faster, better, more efficient, um, and make it scalable. Um, we, we have a few more questions, uh, before time's up. Ignacio. Say hello. Thank you. Yeah, let us know what you're up to. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm here from Chile speaking. Uh, I have seen you uh, Twitter through the other account, uh, Endangered Tokens. I, I, I think we have talked about it a little bit. We were a startup, and um, I, I'm so humbled to be here, uh, I, feeling part of this movement, uh, this refi movement. Um, we've been working alongside my co founder um, from over like a year now. And um, we're we're working on the protection of endangered species through tokenization so nowadays we're working here in chile protecting the species gomortega keule is an endangered tree only present here an endemic species that it's only four thousand specimens are alive now in the world um so our approach to it is like there's no incentives for them to be, be being taken care of like uh landowners will cut them down before government uh, discovers them because if not, they cannot do anything with the land. So the incentives there are is that uh, you or you protect the trees by yourself, by your own means, 
or, or you hide them from the government. So we, we wanted to, to change that. We wanted to, to change the incentives towards uh, protecting these trees. So we thought about NFTs and I, I, I resonate so much with what, um, uh, uh, what well, Neil was doing biodiversity credits and then this guy from Atlantis, Dow, so it's so similar, but on an, from another perspective, so we are actually uh, have to- tokenized the first 26 keoles and we will be launching this NFT soon. Uh, we, we are a little bit late, actually. We, we hoped to launch the last, last week, but we're probably going to last a little bit longer. And at the same time, in order to, to, to support this ecosystem, to keep the incentives running, we are doing collaboration with artists that will support this ecosystem. So the actual stakeholders of the tokens that we will be selling, the, the, the god parents of these trees, uh, when you buy this tokenized tree, you will become like the god parent. You will be able to foster further uh, protection of this tree and you will be able to actually receive gains from these collaborations with, with, with artists. We're going to do tourism regarding the protection of these ecosystems and reforestations around these endangered trees so you can get some carbon credits we would love to collaborate with open forest or you, you uh, i think token token protocols doing something like that i would love to speak to the people doing these things because we are new at, at, at this part of the of this ecosystem we we we, ha- we have the keoles and we have the conservation program so fresh and we are tokenizing this but all the collabor- collaboration with you would be awesome to just learn from your experience uh all these years working so thank you for the space um i would love to to keep uh, participating with you uh and, and knowing to you better and i hope we can collaborate in the future um i if, if you want just follow us on twitter is ant foundation um endangered tokens and uh thank you for for the space yeah i mean i think Ignacio, there's a lot for from us, you know, for us to learn from you as well. It's, it's mutual in terms of, you know, like seeing your project on Gitcoin, right, and like adding that to my collection and cart and being able to share and you know, like talk about that. Like that, it's it's a pleasure, and so I appreciate you showing up. Thank you. It's a pleasure. The pleasure is mine. Cool. Let's see. We had um, another question. Matriots. Um, I'm gonna, I, I'm not saying it right. I don't think so. Well, welcome. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks for the work that you and everyone else is doing here. I'm new to this. Uh, my name is Michael, by the way, and um, <clears throat> just really uh, um, want to share a little bit about what we're doing in this uh, space and just getting started with the, this movement of Matriots. And wanting to build this out to be a, a global movement to, uh, from the, the book of the Ministry of the Future, there's a term that I came across of matriots, spelled like patriots, and uh, matriotism of people who love the planet instead of uh, just a, a single country. And uh, my background is in heart health. I'm also known as the heart health guy. And as I've dug more into heart health, the thing that is healthiest for humans is the same thing that's the healthiest for the the planet and to uh you know heart health and earth health are inextricably connected that uh, if we would eat fewer animals and the as you all know the animal industry is uh, agriculture industry is the second largest contributor behind buildings to to producing carbon this would be a, a huge impact for the health, the well-being of, of uh, us all and to uh, to this work that everyone's in, involved with. And, and uh, I, I'm really new to this space and uh, just making the transition from uh, working with people on their, their heart health to uh, the intersectionality of, of that and earth health. And um, I really loved what was said about uh, having a more diverse group in this community. And uh, as uh, um, a little bit more of my background, I was the technical director with uh, Global Voices and America Speaks. We put on some of the largest town hall meetings um, in the world. If you're familiar with Gavin Newsom's book, uh, Citizenville, about taking the, the town hall digital, 
that's uh, he the inspiration to that book. Um, he credited attending the the World Economic Forum in two thousand five when he saw our process that which was used for the first global risk assessment that was done with fifteen hundred participants at Davos where he got the idea of using the same process, which we then worked with him for participatory budgeting. And, and you know, I don't know how I haven't been tracking what's been happening in this space with DAOs and, and everything else, but this is like my dream come true to have these decentralized uh, autonomous organizations that are that are, are governed by the people using technology of voting. And, and I know that there's a lot that are struggling right now with process, with technology and how to make it engaging and keep people in. And this is like my love. So I mean, all of this coming together, the, the, the way that to, to have people talk, to come to consensus and uh, to have different processes to engage people, to educate them about what is, uh, and educate us all. And I'm not saying like I'm arrived anywhere, but about the, the issues and, and to create a heart centered world to, uh, which is the same as an earth center world. And I love that earth and heart are, pre- are the, the same word if you just slide the H one side to the other. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, that's what uh, the matriots are, you know, there's also a, the spelling also comes from the word Argonauts, the, the bravest, strongest uh, force in Greek mythology of, um, we're all sailors on this planet Earth. We are 7.9 billion members strong. And uh, most of us are unaware that we are uh, on this ship sailing at an enormous speed and just in our, our uh, uh, ride around the sun and the, in our, it's like 67,000 miles per hour as we're, we're in our orbit around the sun and it's 500 and something thousand miles an hour as we're expanding out from the center of the, the galaxy. I mean, we're full sail right now, but we need an all hands on deck and we'll be uh, hosting some all hands on deck meetings that, uh, you know, of what we can all do to, to, uh, uh, reduce our, our footprints, re- re- reduce the animal agricultural f- footprint, and to uh, live healthy, happy, uh, fulfilling lives as uh, matriots of our, of our ship. And I, by the way, I just made everyone, you know, it's an opt-out organization. There's two ways to not be a matriot. One's to join Elon and go to Mars, and the other is in a pine box buried in the Earth. Um we don't recommend either. We, we, uh, and once you have heard about Matriots, you're automatically a, a Matriotino, which is a Matriot in name only. And uh, we'll be rolling out uh, more info about this. This is awesome. So cool. What was your name, actually? I missed that. It's Michael Smith. And, hey, uh, Michael. You, on, this on is... Twitter, you'll find me as one of the we. Cool. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, as also the heart health guy. Heart health guy. Hey, um, Michael, I hope you don't mind, Timo, if I kind of cap this off. I just wanted to touch base on what you shared. Um, to me, there's something really profound in recognizing this beautiful metaphor and truth that what's good for our hearts is good for the planet. And this further exemplifies, I think, the real story of who we are as humans, which is utterly dependent upon the earth and each other. And that when we resonate from our heart space and come from a place of love towards one another, towards the planet, and we realize that that which we do unto other people and to the planet, we do unto ourselves, beautiful things can happen. Because the suffering of my neighbor is not the suffering of my neighbor, it's the suffering of myself. And the pollution in the river is the pollution in my veins. And I think if we can take this consciousness forward, we can fight this crisis and build a better future for tomorrow. So thanks everybody for your time. It's been really special. Yeah, yeah, all over. Yeah, yeah. And, and Michael, just also goosebumps. Uh, I don't know if you saw my tweet about chapter 85 in Ministry for the Future. Um, to me, and, and John, I don't know if you've seen that either, but if you read, just, just pull out chapter 85 in Ministry for the Future and it talks about all the different groups like reforestation and um, desert for desert, desertification and heart health. And I mean, just the names that Ken, Kim Stanley Robinson rattles off on those four or five pages in that chapter. It, it basically gives me chills every time I read it because I feel like the people on this call and the people working in this space 
are those people. I, I really feel like we are the ministry for the future. So with, with that, I, I appreciate everyone's time. John, it's a pleasure as usual. We're, we're going to figure out the next week and, you know, we got some holidays coming up. But I, and, I, and I'm going to go over to uh, Clubhouse with uh, Kianga and Anchor, Anchor Dows. So if anyone wants to join us over there. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Epic chat. Cool, cool. And just quick question. Anybody who is here today, tweet out what you'd like to talk about next week. If you're really passionate about a particular lens, we want to crowdsource this and also create an opportunity for other people to host share conversations and really expand the reach of who we're talking to and who we're connecting with. So yeah, thanks everybody. It's been really special and uh, we'll see you next week. Happy holidays, everyone.